Thank you, thank you. I'm usually not used to intros. I just come and answer your questions and speak. I actually have some flyers that I actually use um, in my farm. So I'm going to share those with you so you guys know what we pass out as some examples. <clears throat> um, I'm just going to start with, why should we farm? For those that currently farm, you probably already know. If you're getting business from it, then you're, you're reaping the benefits of your labor, of the time that you've spent for you know, the year that you did it or maybe the multiple years that you've been doing it. But I'm going to break it down based on how I kind of quantify the value it provides to my business so that you guys could think about it in maybe a different way outside of you know, just getting listings, helping clients, and then ultimately getting a paycheck. Um, I'm going to cover the servicing side. I'll tell you how much time I spend per listing. First call, 30 minutes. I book the consult. The initial consult and walkthrough is at most 90 minutes or an hour to an hour and a half. But I'm going to be conservative and say it takes more time. The pricing conversation, 30 minutes. The negotiations, 30 minutes. A co congratulatory call, one minute. So I've spent 4.01 hours per listing of my time. And if my average price point is 1.2 million at an average commission in our area of 2.5% divided by 4.16 hours, my hourly working a listing is $7,000 in 470 per hour. Now, you might be wondering, there's a lot more that goes into a listing than these handful of activities. There is, but it's not my responsibility anymore. That's how I'm able to do a lot of listings. I don't have the stats here because it's not my computer, but I pulled it for another class that I taught last week. Um, we're in San Mateo County, and San Mateo and Santa Clara County is what we consider the Silicon Valley, you know, south of San Francisco. We currently rank, out of the last two and a half, three years, number 14 out of total listings sold successfully, counts. And out of the top 14, we are number five, where nine out of the people in front of me are discounters. Whether it's a Redfin company, whether it's a person that advertises discount, whether it's a person that has a, you know, a gimmick of if we represent the buyer for your listing, we don't charge a buyer commission, those are all variations of discount. So you're learning from someone that's currently applying farming strategies, takes listings at a consistent basis, is highly leveraged with the team, and I don't do much. <laughs> I, I, I only do a handful of activities. Um, listings obviously also allow you to market, right? And you get intimate market knowledge because when you're giving presentations, which I'm happy to share what I do during my presentations, you are typically very keen to what's going on. And if you're getting consistent listings and you're hosting auto open houses, or rather I don't host anymore, my agents do, because they want to find the opportunities and work the buyer opportunities, we have team meetings on Mondays and they always report to me how many groups, how many neighbors, how many are actual buyers, positive, negative feedback, and then if they talked about disclosures, if they talked about offers, and gives me intel so I can have multiple feelers out there that are obviously my agents to be able to give that data and information to my sellers to be highly educated um, and not just look at data like pendings and solds because that's like what's happened in the past, but having real-time data of how many people are coming through and is it increased, de increasing, decreasing, or is the rate environment influencing what's going on with you know, consumer behavior? That's all going to factor into what I share with the client. Um, and listings get more listings. You know, similar to what was said earlier, like your signs in the yard on the weekends, uh, we, we dabble in a gray area and leave our signs out in the cities that we serve. So people, <laughs> people see our signs pretty much all weekend. Um, but it's, it's free exposure outside of your efforts, out of, outside of your postcards, outside of your events. Like listings show proof of concept that, hey, you're doing something valuable and the community will see it and they're going to question like, why, 
why is this person getting consistent listings? It creates curiosity where they are forced to really call you because they have to find out, even if it is you know, a multiple agent scenario, they're gonna wanna talk to multiple people and you should be the default choice where they at least call you. And you have to prove to them that how you show up online, how you show up on postcards, on your marketing, is the same person that can provide value when you show up for the consultation and help them throughout the process. Um, so what to look out for? Farming, it starts up front. So someone I really listened to, and I, we were listening to this person along the way when we were driving up here, is Rav, uh, Naval Ravikant. Have you guys heard that guy before? If you guys haven't read the book, The Almanac of Naval Ravikant, it, he's a more a philosoph philosophical thinker. Um, but what he talks about is we, our decisions matter much more than our actions nowadays. Like what we decide on influences the direction that we go. And that's same thought process when it comes to selecting a farm. If you're selecting a farm that's really affluent, for example, you're more likely to encounter more competition. You know, it's a multiple move neighborhood. That means they've gone through a couple agents or one agent and has a, have a solid relationship already. They're more experienced in the home selling, home buying process. So for me, when I was picking my farm, the number one criteria I personally looked for was competition. So I'm sure your leadership team here has something called broker metrics. Broker metrics allows you to search based on a, a time frame and area of who is doing majority of the representations, which you can sort by listing sold. And you're gonna wanna look for an area. So you're gonna compare areas. You wanna look for an area that doesn't have a dominant agent. Now, you totally could pick a place that has a dominant agent, but guess what? Every single listing consultation you're gonna go on, you're likely gonna face that person. If they already have proof of concept and are taking a lot of listings, what are you going to present differently? That means you're gonna have to dissect what the competitor does to figure out how you can win. So there's two parts to the whole anatomy of getting a listing. It's getting the call and then eventually closing the consultation. Half the battle is getting the attention, so someone calls you. But if you're gonna be faced against, or you're always gonna be faced against the top agent in that area that's already consistently getting listings, what's your talk track that's going to convince or get the seller to see the value you provide for you to win? And we're also gonna talk about in a presentation, I feel, because I've gone through a lot over the last couple of years, there's four points of topic and that you have to rank highly for. And I'm gonna give them to you right now. They are, number one, what do you provide of value to get my listing sold for as much as possible? Or what value do you provide to help me accomplish the goal? As we know, some sellers, it's not getting the highest price. For some sellers, it's optimizing for speed, for example, or optimizing for their cat not to get out of the house during a showing or you know, you diplomatically talking to them and they feel comfortable with you. That's value, right? However that client defines value, you have to provide it. Number two is cost of doing business. Are you guys familiar with any discounters in your area? Yeah. Every market has them. There's a segment of consumers that are always going to prioritize cost of doing business. The question is, what is your business practice and if you want to compete on cost. But what I'll say is, if you stick to, let's say, a strong business practice that you only charge 3% for a listing, these people are probably not gonna work with you. So the question is, are you willing to give up non, what we, could, what we can, would consider at that point, not your ideal client base for more of your ideal client base? So there's value, there's cost of doing business that they prioritize, there's relationships. So going back to you noticing that there's one person that got three listings, they had a stronger relationship than you. And we have to find peace in understanding that we cannot have a stronger relationship than all agents for, if there's 100 households, all 100 households. But what we can do with the law of abundance in mind is you will build the relationships that are valuable to you with the time that you are able to spend with the people that you are actually able to meet. So we have, to have, we have to have peace in that, like knowing that we cannot earn everyone's business. 
Even being you know, the number one agent in our marketplace, I only have 10%. That means one in every 10 I actually you know, get and sell. But if you look at broker metrics and you sort by top agents, you're typically going to find if someone is dominating a, a farm, it's probably going to be 10% or more. And it's going to be someone that you're going to face every single time. If you're finding that the top five don't even have, let's say, 8% or 6%, that's a very scattered market. There's opportunity for you to show up as number one. You just have to figure out what is everyone's you know, strengths and weaknesses and work it against them. The fourth point is being the neighborhood expert or being perceived as a neighborhood expert. And this is where farming comes into play. If you are perceived as just a person that they should work with, guess who they're going to call? I'll tell you, I started new farm areas within the city I serve. And within the second flyer that I flyered or canvassed, they called me and they said, hey, it looks like you do a lot of work in our neighborhood. We've gotten a couple of your flyers, too. And uh, we want to talk to you about, we just inherited this home. And we don't know what to do with it. So how, if, as long as you can rent, uh, rank highly for four of these, you have a winning chance. Now, your job going into, con into the consultation is really asking questions and taking a consultative approach. Because you're going to want to figure out which of these four are they prioritizing. So, you might have, who's taken uh, Colette Ching's, um, I forget what, what's the class she teaches, but it's about asking valuable questions. One of the questions I learned from her to ask is, as a result of us getting together today, what is the most important thing or things you want to accomplish? And then also, as you search for an agent, just like you, I would do my due diligence to talk to multiple people. So I respect the fact that you will talk to multiple agents. But what are you looking for in the agent that you will choose to hire? What do you want that the agent will either provide or that the agent has in terms of resources or the skills that the agent has, negotiation or you know, business plan, putting the, the sale process together? So your job is to figure out which one they're prioritizing. And really, as much as I have a 15-point canned presentation for a listing consultation, I will talk about the main ones that they are focused on. And that way, I'll, I'll give you a cheat code too. If you search our YouTube, I have a playlist. It's called Seller's FAQ Playlist. I've created videos that I send up front before my consultation so I can save time so I don't have to present the same topics every single time I meet a seller unless they really need me to. Because obviously, there's only one opportunity to get face to face with the client. Because what I'll tell you is, how often do I actually see the client based on what I shared with you in terms of the activities that I'm responsible for? One time. I see them when I take the listing. Oftentimes, I will also admit, I am not a one call closer. Do you guys know what a one call closer is? You signed a listing agreement at that consultation. You might ask, why, Wilson? We've all been trained. I mean, the Mike Ferries of this world and all the aggressive sales coaches tell us that we need to sign a contract, right? That's the purpose of getting together. I'll ch challenge that thought. I have won more listings because I made the consumer feel comfortable with me as much as they're talking to multiple agents because I gave them all the information, all the options that they could consider, including why don't you just stay here? Including, why don't you rent your house out instead of selling it? Because if they know their options and you're the one that actually provides it, they actually see you aligned as a partner instead of butting against what they feel is in their best interest. So if you align your interests with them by sharing everything they could think of and the things that they haven't thought of but they should know, guess who they're going to work with? You. So that's why my consultations are an hour and a half, sometimes maybe longer. The more quality time I spend up front, just like any relationship, right? Whether it's you know, your partner or a team member, the more time you spend up front, just like you know, what career visioning teaches us, if you guys have taken that class before, it's about making sure that you go through a very thorough hiring process because you want to see that they want the opportunity, not necessarily they just want a job. You also want to see that they're in it for the long haul, not for you know, just a high paying or an hourly wage right now because they need it. right? 
So same thing with a client. You want to show them that you're willing to you know, commit a little bit more up front so that you're proving to them that you're really fighting for their best interests. You're talking about everything they could think of. And I walk away and I say, whether you decide to sell, to rent, or to do nothing, I just appreciate the opportunity for you just to share feedback with me and you tell me what your decision making is. If you have additional questions after I leave today, please call me, please text me. I'm available to answer any questions that you have. Now, if you do decide to sell, because we're walking away from an opportunity and they're meeting multiple people, my goal is to create a win-win situation and that looks different for every consumer I meet. And I put ideas in their mind. Who's gone through a listing presentation before and they were talking to multiple agents and they made it known to you? Okay. That is more common than them just calling you and making a decision to work with you. They're gonna to talk to multiple people. With that said, I call it the tolerance of the seller. Just like alcohol tolerance or any tolerance, the more li weights you lift, the more you can lift. The more alcohol you can drink, the more your liver can process alcohol. The more the seller hears, <laughs> right? It's true, right? The more the seller hears, the higher the tolerance the seller has in terms of what they expect from an agent. So if out of three agents they talk to, one of them says, yeah, I'm willing to list your home for 1.5%. And we'll still have to offer to 2.5%, but that means the total commission is 4%. Guess what they're going to talk to you? Even if they know you are the best option and you've expressed your value, what are they going to ask you? Can you do it for 4%? I feel comfortable with you. I believe in what you're saying. You, look, you sound and look like a quality person I could work with. And I, I feel like you can help me accomplish my goal. But someone did tell me they would do it for 4%. Are you willing to? You're going to get that question. Or oh, you know, um, I, we really like you, but you know, this other agent, you know, he's a top agent, we're taking a chance working with you. He's willing to cover staging. Are you willing to cover staging? What's our reaction to that? You guys ready? So that's why at the end of the conversation, of course, I give them the high level, this is what doing business with me typically looks like. I give them the going rate. I've already expressed my value. I never talk about price. I never talk about terms and commission until the end. Because I, that's usually the last thing we should focus on. We should focus on helping them accomplish their goals and answering their questions, right, and addressing their concerns. But at the end, I say, my goal is to create a win-win situation for you to accomplish your goals. You've heard many presentations. In fact, I'm, I'm sure you've heard someone say they're willing to cut commission, which obviously we can talk about. If you have heard that, is that really in your best interest? And also, you're not selling because of free staging. You're not selling because you want a free inspection. You're selling because you want to accomplish a goal. My question to you is, as we design win-win and have that in mind, do you see a viable path for us to work together? And do you see accomplishing your goal, like the best option is to work with ourselves, or what have you heard that you, would, that you haven't heard from me that you would like to share with me so that we can craft a business plan to work together and get me working for you. And that was a long-winded way of saying, hey, look, I'm, I'm willing to create something win-win. Tell me what you've heard. Tell me what you haven't heard. Let's put it all together on paper. So what you're saying is if we put this and that together and we subtract this, that you're willing to start today. But even if you are, hey, look, I'm going to leave this with you, and I want you to sleep on it. Talk to your spouse. Talk to your family members. If it's an inheritance, talk to your siblings or whoever is a beneficiary, because you're a fiduciary for the whole process, I'll call you tomorrow, or I'll call you at the end of the week just to check in on you and see if you've made a decision. And that makes them feel super comfortable. You know, That's very different from the person that pressured them to sign something. And they will usually tell you if you're, if you're what, what they typically say is, you are really refreshing to hear. Because I even joke about when I go in consultations, hey, look, the last thing you want is inviting a realtor to your home because your expectation of a realtor is you really need me or you really need an agent and you wouldn't call me to visit your home unless you really were thinking about doing this and I believe you but my goal today is not to encourage you or discourage you to do anything I'm just here to help you make a decision so um, any questions so far on that in terms of presentation in terms of talking points I know that cut in 
prior to getting the listing opportunity, it's how do I get the, the, the opportunity? So we'll cover that. Okay, well, um, yes? So like your 30 minute initial call that they have with the client, so which is, who takes over from your team there between that and the walkthrough? Great question. Let me show you something. I kind of summarized it. So you see servicing right here? The green is what I do. The red is a summarized version of what a listing coordinator does. So let's just walk through it. First call I handle. I send an invite out. I hide guest. And I invite my listing coordinator so she knows that I have a consultation coming up. She will verify with me if, she, if I need her at the consultation. Because some of these, if it's very competitive, I would rather take care of multiple things at that consultation than wait for a follow-up to do a walkthrough with a vendor. So if she's going to show up, she usually invites a vendor to give feedback. And I am not a aesthetically like knowledgeable person outside of I know what gets a return. She's much more, you know, informative when it comes to, hey, this is what you should do if you know this is a situation in the kitchen or you know, this is what the yard currently is, or it's an inheritance, and there's a lot of things that you want to dispose of in the house, but we can help you coordinate vendors. So she adds a layer of kind of a different, you know, you know how when you host open houses, sometimes you want a lender there because they can talk about different things and they can capture contacts outside of us being agents. That's kind of what's going on here. So she would join us for, she'll ask if she, if she needs me to be there or if she, um, if I need her to be there. And she may or may not show up, but that's usually my trial close too. If I didn't get the signature that day and she didn't have to shadow me or join me for that meeting, I usually will suggest to the client and ask, Hey, look, a really good next step. We have to get into a really good habit of establishing next steps and expectations of what it's like to work with you. So we need to give them clarity on exactly what they should expect from us, what we expect from them, because it's easier to flow through the sales funnel to get it signed. So um, what I would typically say as a post close or you know a trial close is, hey, would it be helpful if I pre-scheduled? I know you haven't made a decision yet, but pre-schedule a time for you to meet a vendor or two, and also our listing coordinator to give you feedback on what you should do to the property so you can sell for more money. They're not going to say no to that. So you, even if you didn't get it signed, the listing agreement, you are already working for the client. And it will lead you to the point where you're actually going to sign and formally be uh, in business. Yes? So uh, also, are you then paying for that staging consultation? So, in our area, staging consultations and walkthroughs with my listing coordinator is complimentary because they work with me. So our stages don't charge anything. And also, the, the contractors are there to give quotations. They usually don't charge for that initial walkthrough. So, and they want the business. They know we've given them con consistent business. So they're willing to you know, show up um, no, up front. Um, well, so, so since we're talking about vendors real quick, how do your vendors show up in your business? So uh, as far as uh, are they a wealth determinant for you and how do they help support your business to uh, advance and things like that? Yeah. Really good question. They definitely support our business by providing competitive quotes. So here's additional point because uh, we're going to bring it up. Oftentimes they're going to contest any sort of vendor quote that are, they're going to give you and they're hoping that it's the most competitive quote. We've f been faced with that. And at times your vendor is not going to be the cheapest option, right? But Here's the thing that we need to express to the client so they understand what we need to balance besides cost. It's cost of the quality of work, sorry, it's cost of the work, then it's the quality of the work and the responsibility if something goes wrong, are they willing to show up again to fix a problem? And third is the speed of work. As we know, we're in a shifting market, it's seasonal, and also we're in a cyclical period where obviously rates are kind of fluctuating higher. Speed to on market, so you have a predictable expectation setting with the client about market dynamics and how that's going to influence the results they get is very important. So with that said, when they, obviously a lot of them are going to prioritize costs, like, oh my gosh, this quote is so expensive. I had much cheaper people paint my house. Then I'll, I'll share, first off, we're never opposed to work with a vendor you already have, and we can project coordinate that vendor. Do you have their contact? Let's get a quote from them. 
I guess I apologize up front that we didn't talk about that during our first consultation, but obviously having this person as a option sounds like something that would benefit you and you would be comfortable with, right? So that's what I would do. Um, I prepare market stats. It takes me a couple minutes. Then I do the initial consultation, which we can talk about. Trial close a vendor walkthrough. We usually docu-sign um, the listing agreement. The listing coordinator gives progress updates. The listing coordinator coordinates all vendors, including we get pre-inspections in our area and point of sale. The listing coordinator, the seller disclosures. The listing coordinator communicates with our creative team to get the marketing collateral, photos, video, Matterport. I jump on a quick call to do pricing. It takes me 15 minutes to pull stats to convey my expertise. And then we jump on a 15 minute call to talk about it. Excuse me. And then our agents host open houses. Updating client, we have a VA that summarizes all stats. We ask all of our agents, as you heard, to give us information on how many groups, were they valid buyers, did they ask for disclosures, positive and negative feedback, did they suggest writing an offer, summarize all that, send an email that we sent every Monday after our open house weekend. And at most, I will reply to that email that my staff sends, hey, this is on par, below par, above par, we're doing well, we're not doing well, we need a price reduction. My decision making to them is based on data. It's not my opinion. That way they believe what it is because they can't contest data. And the data also comes from if you have an office and you're not consistently getting listings yet, maybe it's going to be a good habit for us in this, you know, your weekly team meeting to start talking about how your open houses did. And there's no competition. I know some of us might farm the same areas, but at the end of the day, like I said, everyone's going to build different quality relationships with different people. So if you can share that data, imagine how much more empowered you are when you have those conversations with your clients. And that's going to be helpful for everyone, for our office to win, to get more listings, because ultimately there's more open house opportunities, all that. Anyways, I digress. Um, fielding questions is what my responsibility is, but it's filtered by my listing coordinator. Unless they express specific interest that they're interested in writing an offer and they want to talk to me about interest, I will direct them to my filter, which is my listing coordinator, which will answer it, you know, usually questions about, hey, you know, the person, the inspector wasn't able to go into crawl space. Do you have any de details on that? Or how old is the roof? Like, if I was in your market, you guys would hate me representing a buyer for a listing that I'm representing because I never pick up the phone. Because guess what I'm doing? I'm looking for the next listing opportunity. I'm talking to my clients. I'm training my agents. I'm doing the high dollar production productive task. And not to say that I'm above answering questions from agents, but have you guys ever heard the moment that you wake up, you pick up your phone, it's your emails and those people that sent the emails that are controlling your time? I truly believe that. I don't want to be the gopher that lifts up my head when I get pinged. But you have to earn your way into that point in your business where you understand every process so you can delegate that work. So you can prove that you can focus on the highest dollar producing task, which ultimately, guess what? Everyone's happier that way anyways. If your business is growing, your, your staff could make more money, your agents could make more money, and ultimately, you're going to have more clients and they're going to be raving fans. Um, receiving and summarizing offers is my listing coordinator. We use Disclosures IO to receive offers. We summarize all offers on a sheet, the big bullet points. We send it before my scheduled call, which is scheduled by the listing coordinator for a Google Meet. And all I do is I review the sheet. I, we come to a plan. Seller agrees. And the listing coordinator sends it out for counter offers, for example. Um, and then once we go on escrow, my escrow coordinator takes over for all communications. And that's why the only responsibility I have at the end is a congratulations. How was your experience working with the team? Think about this, guys. You've heard this before. If you guys have a family member that's going through you know, some sort of surgery, the doctor is taking care of the surgical procedure, runs a show for which nurses and which specialist is going to be on site and who's going to be in the ICU before they transfer you to you know, you know, the typical recovery area. And guess what? You're only going to see your doctor during the procedure and maybe a call one week and two weeks after your procedure 
just to check up on you. But you as a consumer, as long as you know what to expect and the doctor explained that whole process to you, you're happy because you feel like every person a part of the process at the hospital, for example, took care of your needs. And you would be a raving fan to say this whole establishment is great because I had a great experience and I'm fully recovered. Dr. So-and-so and their team, you've seen these reviews before as you're looking for your own vendors. So that's the thought process behind this, why there's certain things that you should do and there's certain things that you probably could delegate away. And you could be super efficient and effective with your time for you to be out there more building relationships in your farm and getting more opportunities and ultimately so making more money. Good question. Usually I'm the one negotiating it. I'll give the terms to the listing coordinator for her to put it into the PDF or the docu sign. But if I were to delegate negotiations for that in the future, I probably would start including um, people that could take that over. Yeah. Thank you. So how many sign calls do you get versus text leads? Um, great question. I think in the past, um, a lot more people called. And nowadays, with in the internet being so easily accessible through you know, phone and computer, more people are receiving flyers or postcards or information and referencing you online. So I think it's more important than ever to have a really good social proof online. The main ones I would have is Yelp and Google. Yelp in the city or in the Bay Area is really big. I'm sure it's pretty big here too. Uh, if you guys use it, your consumers are probably using it. As long as you, so I'll give you some hacks on that too, is you can tag every photo. So what you'll see is we have 200 reviews plus on Yelp, but we have 6,000 photos. The 6,000 photos all have captions for keywords that we want to be searched on Yelp. Yelp, obviously, the algorithm also goes into Google in some way or fashion. So obviously, that affects your Google results, too. Um, but going back to, I would say, less than half directly call. The majority of people research you before they call, send you a text, or email you, or register on your site. So you want to make sure that all this collateral from your website to your social proof sites to obviously um, your postcard are all cohesive. Cohesive as in the branding, as in what to expect, as in the language. And the more clear and simple you make your call to action, the better. So here's what I mean. If you have on your postcard your email, your website, your phone number, a QR code, you know, an Eventbrite you know, event thing, that's too much. As we all know we get fatigued when we have too many options, but if we, if we have one option and we know what we want, guess what we're going to do? We're just going to use that one option. The top agents in the Bay Area that I know that are top listing agents that are farmers have one method of contact, and it's intentional, and it's a phone number on the postcard. But you're still going to get requests online, so that's why you need to build out your website. You need to build out your social proof. So that's personal experience. So somebody makes an inbound call, who picks up that call while, while you're here today? I'm forwarding calls to my assistant right now. Yeah. And, and, and when your answer service picks up, is that a VA or is that somebody in your office? Really good question. Um, I have VAs and I also have in-house. In what I will share is if you call a doctor's office and you have some sort of serious procedure that's going to cost a lot of insurance money, you probably want someone in that office answering your questions. You probably, as a consumer, would feel a bit more comfortable. Um, and not, nothing against VAs. There's American-based VAs, too, which might work better. But if I'm meeting my staff on a you know, every other day basis in the office or having consistent conversations, they're going to understand better how I think and how I address situations. They're going to shadow more calls from me where a VA is far further away, and you know Zoom to a certain extent is helpful for team meetings. But then you miss so much in, in like in between communication that I feel like the quality of conversation that someone's going to have, even with a client for an up call, is going to be better if someone is based somewhere close by to you to understand how you run your business, how you think, to answer questions. Because, for example, if someone based in the area will know the nuances, as we know, of different neighborhoods, different com construction type. Not to say they need to know this, but they will hear you talk about it. Or if they live in a certain area, they understand, like, you know, in our area, apartments are for rent, condos are for sale, right? But in the Philippines, someone might think they're the same thing. But one's sellable and one's rentable, right? 
But these are the nuances that consumers might pick up, and you just never know if there's a reason why they choose or not choose to work with you. So I, I rather not let that come to chance. And even if it's a bit more expensive to have someone in the house, guess what? You're investing in your business, and if this person was hired correctly and um, can grow within the business, the value add for this person being in your business is just so much higher than a VA that hits a ceiling of you know capacity to serve in the business. Great question. So because you're talking about your team, so how many realtors do you have, uh, realtor partners do you have on your team? So on our team, we currently have 11 agents. And I technically have a brokerage side. We have nine agents there. The difference is different splits. Team splits are very traditional KW splits. I have a very traditional KW team, 50-50. It scales a little higher for their sphere. Um, because we take off so much off their plate for listings, I we cap listings at 50%, but as you know, the traditional KW model, as you guys were at the MREA, the listing agent role is usually a salary plus bonus. So who's a team leader in this room? Or a solo agent? Cool, who, who is a team member? Cool, so these are just some things that you just want expectations you know, understood with your team leader if you're a team member. Like, long term, my longevity on this team, like what would it look like if I grow, if I do a lot of business, like can, can we talk about structure so we exactly know what to expect as we grow. So we have these conversations. I've made my mistakes. I've lost team members too. So um, there's certain things that you would do. But brokerage members are on a higher split, but they carry their own brand. Um, and I really, it's like a coaching relationship for me. I jump on a call on a weekly basis. They're more self-sufficient. And I just help them make business decisions, hiring, you know, how to grow the team, because that's kind of what I do. So, yeah. So, and then this year's down. I think we're probably going to end up around 120 mil, which is a lot less. Um, maybe a little more. I'm not including our brokerage members. Uh, in 21, we did 251 million, and then in 22, we did 210 million, and then. The team side, we did 175 and 160 million of that production for those two respective years. And I'm still the main listing agent. I guess you can consider us a six level team. I'm not completely out. And um, you know, I've, I've met with Gary before too, and he's back at the helm as CEO, as you guys know. And even he's not seventh leveled. I think there is a, there, there's a desire for all of us to get to a seventh level. But what we realize is without us in the business, even if it's like minimal time, it's hard for it to grow since, I mean, you guys read MREA. It goes from your D to the organization's drive, right? Um, but even Gary's not seventh level right now. He's making decisions. He's in the business day to day. I mean, especially during this more unpredictable kind of market in time, I think it's ever more important that you start seeing team leaders start getting back into production. Most of the mega teams or Gary's top 100 the agents are in production. Yeah. So, um, and the database follow up, once it closes, I congratulate them and someone updates the database and it's tagged correctly and they get invites to certain things. Most of my sellers move out of area, so actually my buyer's agents benefit more, after, like post close measures, because they're staying within the area. Most of my sellers are moving out. And I, I want to pose a question. Out of Who's read the MREA? I should have asked that up front. How much should we be spending on marketing in our business? Percentage-wise. Percentage of GCI. What's the rule of thumb? 10%. 10%. Technically 9, but let's round up to 10. Just make the math easy. So that means if your business in the last 12 months generated 250000 you should be spending about 25000 in marketing. What does marketing mean? It could mean your website. It could mean pay-per-click. It could mean you know Zillow Premier Agent. It could mean Facebook online leads. It could mean the flyers that you hand out at your open houses or as you farm. That's a good benchmark for you to use. If you're spending less, good job. You probably are benefiting more on profit or that money's going somewhere else in your business. But if you're looking to grow, you probably want to spend around 10%. And then you want to track, obviously, as we heard, the red light, green light. If something's not working, when do you cut it off? Farming does take a lot of patience, though. Um, but with that said, my question to you is, if you guys are spending 10%, how much of that 10% is geared towards sellers versus buyers right now? 
Because if most of it is generating buyer leads to feed your team or to feed your current book of business, you're gonna to want to reconsider how much you spend towards buyers versus sellers. Here's why. Listings is like defense on a team. Listings get you more listings and buyers. Buyers, you don't get an opportunity to put your sign up in the yard. Buyers can make a decision today they're not willing to buy anymore because rates just went up. Now I get it. You guys are also gonna say, well, sellers could also decide they don't wanna sell anymore. That's true, but oftentimes once you go into a listing consultation, they don't really want to sell unless, if they invite you, they, they actually have really true intent to sell. Um, but I challenge you to think about how much are you spending for listing business? Because if you do know the value of a listing compared to a buyer, and not to say you shouldn't work buyers, you should be putting your money where your beliefs are. You should be investing in getting listing business. So with that, um, we track impressions, attempts, contacts, appointments. Impression stands for how often does someone see something from you. Attempts is if you obviously are canvassing and no one opens or someone opens. Contacts are live conversations and face-to-face -face or over the phone. And if you book an appointment, that's pretty obvious. Now, success is a math equation. Do you guys know who said that? Gary, Gary said that. That is correct. Um, success is a math equation. So I'll break the math down for you. I'll tell you, I most of the time do not door knock. Does that surprise you? You guys came to the class and we talk about farming, or when we think farming, we usually think door knocking. Farming encompasses using USPS, EDDM. Farming encompasses canvassing. Farming encompasses just everything that you could do within a geographic area. But I find it personally more efficient to hit more doors during a month time with the same amount of hours, let's say you commit 10 hours per month to farm, I find it more efficient if I'm canvassing. So what's canvassing? Canvassing is not knocking on every door. Canvassing is making sure that you leave something of value behind, but you do have conversations with the people that you bump into. So for example, if I have an hour to spend in my farm today, I can canvass our area is a bit more dense, might be harder for you to hit 80 doors per hour, but I hit 80 doors per hour if I canvas. I'm intentional about my conversation, so who's in high I here? You are probably gonna have long-winded conversations, so you're gonna wanna be more mindful of having a conversation take away from your efficiency to be able to canvas more. Who's a SC? You probably won't show up to the doors. Just kidding. <laughs> but if you do, but if, but if you do, you're gonna act a little more timid, right? And you're gonna try to get out of there. So we're gonna talk about body language too. Who's ID here? Okay. You're gonna be super intentional and you're gonna come off as cold because you are on a mission to just capture contacts and you're walking away. But if you're high DI, maybe, maybe you're gonna have a lot of um, you know, detailed conversations too. But you just wanna be mindful of your behavior because your behavior is gonna dictate your results that you're gonna get as well as much as you're also gonna to want to understand who's the consumer that obviously you're gonna be talking to. Out of 80 doors, you're still gonna bump into about five to 10 people. I'm just rounding it to eight. And you should get to a point where your conversion rate of capture, from contact to capturing contact information, which we can role play, is gonna be about 25%. If you're super intentional, it should be closer to one third, if not 40%. Who wants to role play that? Please come on up. Let's do it. So you're, you're, you're the homeowner, okay? Um, I'm gonna, I'm, you're, doing, you're working on your garden, okay? <laughs> Sorry, I don't know your name, so I'm not gonna ask, because obviously this is role play. Hi, how's it going? Good, good. I'm Wilson, by the way, nice to meet you. Good to meet you, yeah. Your name is? Linda. Linda, it's a pleasure to meet you. Gardening on a hot day. You're brave. I'm ready. OK. Yeah. Well, it looks great. You've done a great job here. You're probably wondering why I'm here. Do you want well, to give me a little help over here with this? Yeah. Soil? Do you need help with the soil? <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll give you guys a trick, just a short break from role play. The best time to door knock is trash day. Because the law of reciprocity, they're never going to want your help to take their own trash, obviously. But if you offer, do you need help with that? guess what they're gonna do? Wow, this guy's nice, and then subconsciously, they're gonna open up to a conversation. Trash day is great. 
whether it's before or during, or before or after Trash Day. But let's get back to role play. Linda, right? Yeah, yeah. Linda, thank you so much. Uh, it's good to see neighbors out here, and we wanted to make sure a lot of people here are 49er fans. Did you watch a game over the weekend? Uh, no, I missed it. Okay, well, here's the calendar schedule. I know some people, they, they have their phones nowadays, but a lot of people just like something that's visually like available, just so you know which ones are away in home games. Also, this is just something that we put together in case you ever think about improving your home. We have a lot of ideas and case studies in here. By the way, Linda, how, how long have you lived here? Just a year. Not just a year? year well, yeah. welcome to the neighborhood. You've Thank probably you. seen some of the events that we host. I would love to get you to come to our next picnic, by the way. It's going to be at Westboro Park, and it's a kid-friendly event. Do okay. you have kids or grandkids or kids, kids sure. in the family? Yeah. Great. You should invite them. By the way, um, Linda, L-I-N-D-A? Yeah. Okay, yeah. perfect. And what's a good email? Is it a Gmail or a Yahoo? It's a Gmail. Okay, what is it? Um, one, two, three at Gmail. Okay, great. Yeah. And then what's your best number? Is it a 415 or 650? And she'll correct me if it's not either one of those because she feels compelled to correct me. It's a 916. 916, perfect. 916? Uh, 838. Perfect. Now, act like you're not going to give me contact because it's our first oh, meeting. Sure. Like, yeah. By the way, what's your best scheme? I would love to invite you to one of our events. Our next one is a picnic. Do you post your events somewhere where I could you know, notice it? You know, really good question. Occasionally we do have it in our postcards, but just in case the postcard or the flyer is not timely, I still want to invite you because you're a neighbor. And it's our way of giving back to the community. That's why we host these events for free. Mm -hmm. So maybe email is not as convenient. What's your best phone number? Is it a 619 or 415? Well, I don't think I'm that interested, really. I'm, I'm pretty busy right here. That's it's totally OK. Party. In fact, you know, I, <laughs> I would love to help you. Just let me know what you need. And I totally get it. You're meeting me for the first time. I'm a total stranger. If I was in your shoes, <laughs> I probably wouldn't give my contact information away. <laughs> My commitment, Linda, is a lot of neighbors have asked me to keep them abreast on what's going on in the market. But most importantly, we have family-friendly events. So I just want to make sure I invite you. So I wouldn't yeah. be doing my job if I didn't ask you again. Do you mind texting me? Not yeah, me. that's great. What's your best number? Yeah, 916. you got to ask more than one time. You're going to eventually get it. And guess what? If you don't get it, here's one thing I want you guys to take away. The way she acts is the same way she's going to act with any other agent. If the barrier to entry is lower, mm -hmm. just like the open house guest that walks in your open house that gives you the contact just because you asked, is also the same person that gave it away two open houses ago. So the more time you can spend up front having a quality conversation, expressing the value you can provide at this moment, and even if she says no, my goal is eventually I'm going to break down the barrier because let's say she did not give it to me. Here's what I'm going to say. Well, Linda, it's been a pleasure meeting you. I, I totally understand it's our first time meeting, but you're probably going to see me every so often. So hopefully I'll be able to say hi next time, and hopefully we have a timely you know, postcard where it's going to share with you our shred days and all these things that we're going to do. If you ever feel compelled that you have a question for me, just feel free to ask. My name is Wilson. Good to meet you. Thank you so much for your you're time. You're welcome. And I walk away. And guess what? If this person really is defensive, they're going to come to open up to me over time because I'm just going to be that pesky, persistent person that they cannot avoid. I'm going to be in their mailbox. I'm going to be on their street corners. I'm going to be their neighbor, right in front of their neighbor, right? They're going to see me every frickin' where, right? And that's what, what Grant Cardone says, omnipresence. If you're everywhere, they can't avoid you. As long as you're everywhere for the right reasons, because I, I have, we have competitors in our farm. Thank you, by the way. Thank you. Um, we, ha we have competitors that will advertise discount or have boxing gloves on, and it's very memorable, but they say, I beat COVID. My business was sustained. I'm this, I'm that. Guess what? Consumers don't give a fuck about that. <laughs> what they care about is if they have a problem and when they have a problem, who's the first person I think of or I call because they had good intentions when I had met them or when I had encountered something from them. As long as your attempt is to always provide value or come from value, every piece is not going to be valuable in a moment, but eventually one will be. And when they have a need, who are they going to think of? The guy in boxing gloves saying he, they be COVID? Maybe, but for the wrong reasons. Yeah. It should be you. How can we get you there? That's, what, that's why we're having this conversation today. Okay. 
So 80 hours, or sorry, 80 hours, 80 doors per hour, eight contacts per hour, you should capture two people, and I broke it down here. Two hours, two hours, two hour days, two days a week, two hour days, three days a week, three hours a day, five days a week. I highlighted this because that also dictates how big your farm could be. And that dictates how many doors you'll be able to hit. Now, eventually, you're going to supplement your time with every door direct. That's a good use of your money once you start getting results. So you could start a new farm or expand your farm somewhere else in a different part of the town. Now, I also broke down here contacts per hour. So if you guys are on teams or you have your own team and you, you know, obligate your agents to certain contacts per day and contacts per week, this gives you at least maybe a benchmark that you should expect from your team members or for yourself. And here's the cool part. I broke it down by, based on the 25% co nurture, contact to nurture ratio, how many nurtures you should get per week if you do any of these activities. And even if you started light and you have a farm of 1,280, you should be capturing 32, at a conversion, 32 nurtures at a conversion rate of 25%. And eventually, it's going to get saturated where there's going to be a declining value and um, a, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, diminishing return of getting contacts if you got because you've gotten more contacts and people have more people have told you to get lost or don't want your uh, your time or attention. But even if you do that, if you have a farm of 1,280 in a year, I wouldn't be surprised if you were intentional about asking for contact information that you build a database of sellers, almost 400 contacts in your database. Now, if you were committed to this for a year. I'm fairly certain you're going to get results by year two. And by year three, you should be top two, top three, if not top one in that neighborhood. Just the mere fact of them seeing you so much cements in their mind that they should be talking to this person, or this person's very visible, or they're going to start justifying. You're going to hear stuff like this. Well, if they're so visible and consistent for doing this activity, how else are they going to be consistent and visible for my listing, for me? I bring the quality to South City. I do everything that I can to make sure that you get the results that you want. I don't take iPhone photos. I don't advise you just to sell because it's easier for me. I will tell you, based on if you were my family member and I was serving you, and this was your one asset that you get to sell for your family after owning it for 25, 30 years, what's the best route we can take to get the best outcome. Do you think that makes an impact on the decision making? Mm -hmm. Now, what, I, what you'll also learn from me if we get the chance to talk about it is every strong agent has a weakness. Find it. Poke holes at it. For example, if I was farming a new area, I would try to see who's farming. I would try to see who's sending mail. If I have friends or family members or other agents that live in that area, I'm going to instruct them to save every single marketing piece they get from whoever it is. I'm going to research their stats. I'm going to see the quality of their work. I'm going to look at their average list of sales price. I'm going to look at their days on market. I'm going to look at truly, are they getting listings just because they farm? Or are they actually giving quality work? Because if they're not, guess what's going to show up in my language for a consultation? I'm going to poke holes at it. Because just like you guys, I love to frickin' win, right? I'm going to win. We're going to find a way to win. That's, you know, we, we hear this all the time, taking market share, right? Your unfair share. You got to get strategic. You got to figure out a way to win. How do you tactfully do that? How do you tactfully go into someone's home and speak? Give me, Pokeholes. yeah. So I'll give you a really good example. If I'm going up against a top dog that's just had market share for the last 20 years, so if you're in this room, you're going to hate me, but that's me too. I'm going to say, I'm going to give analogies. I, I usually have a profile of the person. So let's say, you know, your profession and what you do and what you enjoy, I'm going to use analogies and I will come up with some. I'll give you an example. You know, when you think of the best golfer, who do you think of now? Most people resonate with Tiger Woods, but unless you truly watch the game and you actually see what they do specifically, it's not Tiger Woods anymore. He hasn't 
you know, won in a long time. That's like the guy that you might be calling. I see his flyers too. Now, what I can share with you, maybe I'll pull up the one listing that this person has that they didn't do quality work mm -hmm. and say, you don't want your listing to look like this, do you? Just because you've been at the top, it doesn't mean it's easy to maintain. Just like anything we do, just because we followed a diet and we fell off a little bit, we, that doesn't mean we can maintain our physique, right? We've all been there. What I can share with you is, based on whatever I'm trying to prove a point of, of my stats that look good, I might pick and choose, that is why you should work with me. Because the perception is not always reality, and I'm here to really find a solution for your goals. Now let's say um, I'm going up against a discounter. Do you guys have Redfin in your market? Oh, I love Redfin. Here's what I know about Redfin. So I know you're interviewing Redfin, and they have this thing where if you buy and sell, they list your property for 1%. I think that's a good value proposition. Clearly, it got your attention. You called. How, how did you like the presentation, by the way? You'll say some things. Well, here's why I have some concern. May I share? Did you hear recently they've gone through so many layoffs? <laughs> Do you know what that means for you as a consumer? They have inconsistencies in their process. In fact, me running a small business, I have to be profitable. I'm not a tech company. I don't go through layoffs. Think about the horrible things that these employees are going through right now. Right? You might be able to take advantage of 1%, but the thing I cannot and you cannot predictably you know, anticipate is, what part of the process once you sign a listing are you not going to get the service for? I'm going to start creating negative curiosity and doubt in your mind. And I'm going to cement myself by saying, here's what's going to happen with us. Melissa is my listing coordinator. She's going to walk you through every step of the way. She's not at risk of losing her job. Secondly is, did you know Redfin agents have huge quotas? Did you know their buyer's agents have to have a pipeline of 50 active buyers and constantly show properties? And guess what? They're not even paid going rate. They earn a small salary, which I don't know what the market rate is here and a small bonus for helping you. Do you think the person that's earning full commission is going to work a little bit harder for you, do a little bit more for you than the person that's earning salary? I think so. If you are compensated at your job for the results you got instead of just the W-2 for you to clock in and clock out, would you work a little harder? Probably. That's why you should work with me. I'm just concerned that if you work with someone that's paid on salary, they don't have your best interests. It's not aligned. Does that make sense? So then you ask who they're interviewing. Like if they say we're interviewing other agents, do you ask, like, may I ask who you are working with? You want to be very strategic in the way you ask. Just like when, you, when someone walks in an open house, I don't think it's a good question to ask, hey, do you have an agent? Here's why. You can indirectly ask questions to figure out if they have an agent. If they end up giving you contact information, they find value in keeping a relationship with you. Even if they had an agent, I never question it because I earned your potential contact and I earned the right to keep in touch with you. So um, just like at a listing consult, I just go to the question, hey, what have you heard? You know, you've lived here for so long. You've probably seen so many people send flyers to you. You've probably seen every single value proposition that you could possibly think of. But what are you looking for in an agent that you want to work with? Have you heard that yet? What have they offered that you are not satisfied with? That obviously, I'm, I'm here today at your home. Clearly, there's something that they did not offer. What is that? And can I create something, win-win, that you would feel comfortable working with us today? Because I know that you find value in what we do, right? Great, what is that? Tell me more. And then I then take a seat back, and I take a consultative approach, which is so much easier because they're selling on why they're going to work with me. Well, I like, the about, I, like this, I like this agent because of XYZ. I don't like this agent because of XYZ, and so forth. So um, you know what I tell my agents all the time, which is on this topic, is my four hours, it's actually just a 30-minute first call and a 90-minute consultation. That two hours dictates if I have a hundred-plus million-dollar business or not. Because if I don't do well in the first call in the consultation, we don't earn the business. So what I have to get really good at, just like you guys, is saying some things over the phone, conveying some information in person, 
and it's either we get a $25,000 commission check or we don't. So if there's anything that you really should take away from today is your presentation skills really matter. What you say, how you say it, how you convey it matters. How you ask questions matters. What you ask matters, right? It has nothing to do with free staging and low cost of doing business. Honestly, it also has nothing to do with your postcard looking good, because if you're consistent, you're probably still going to get the call. But what it is is your presentation skills. And if you guys didn't know, and I'll get to your question, I am an introvert. And i rather be at home with my dogs and read a book and not be out there at open houses, farming. But I've just built this habit of being in front of people um, because it's my job, right? And with that said, it did not come naturally to me. I was a disengaged student that played a lot of video games in my teenage years. And the, at most, my communication was some text over the screen. <laughs> but here I am, you know, years later in this business, this was kind of honed in this business. Why did I share that with you? If I can do it, you could do it. If I could do it, you could do it. You know, I started when I was 22, so age is not a factor. Your, your inexperience is not a factor. You know what is, is your ability just to build a relationship and have a conversation. The more life experiences you have, the more you can relate to other people. And a really good quote that you know, I've been saying a lot from Ed Milet, who knows Ed Milet here, is, you're most capable to help the person you once were. So if you've gone through heartache or headache, or if you've gone through loss in your life, or if you've traveled more and you've seen more things, that relevant experience is going to be appropriate for a lot of your relationships that you have. The reason why I'm standing in front of you today is only because I have gone through some of my own activities a little bit more than you. And that experience, I'm just resharing with you. I'm not reinventing the wheel. Farming is you know, widely known in our industry. But maybe my presentation could spark something where you can become a top agent. You might see me at Family Reunion one of these days, and you say, hey, you know, that one time you came to Roseville, and I learned X, Y, and Z. Well, I got my first two listings. I'd be so happy to hear that. So, sorry. Question. Well, was, uh, I'm, I'm a new agent. And I'm just wondering where do I go to learn my presentation skills? Great question. You got to put pressure on just being out there. <laughs> That's my best advice. Or you could. What they say is teach the thing that you have the most weakness in. Because if you need to hone your skills and repeat and convey and transfer knowledge or skill. You're going to learn it in a different way than just learning it for yourself to use for yourself. So I challenge you to sign up to teach classes at this market center, Elk Grove Market Center, or wherever. Um, and I think the more you do, the more you get better. So for example, I don't know if you know, when I came in here, I was a little nervous. I don't know if you could tell. It's like every time I walk in a room like this, like I don't know what you guys want. That's why I always, my, my, my redirect of attention is, hey, what do you guys want to talk about? Let's, let's write it down. And I'm like, OK, I, I think I have an idea of what we should talk about today. But um, it really just comes from just doing it a lot. Um, you know, Being in front of my team every time we meet, being out on my farm, uh, talking about body language. The more we look like we should be there, the more accepting they are going to be of us and more likely to have a conversation with us. So if we're walking up to the door and we're like, oh, shoot, can I put this flyer? And then the ring goes off and it's like, oh, shoot, they see me. Hi. <laughs> Guess what's going to happen? They're going to be like, the next time I see this Asian dude in my neighborhood, I'm going to walk all over him and tell him he should not be in at my front door. Mm -hmm. But if you act like you belong there and you've gone through that situation multiple times where they say, hey, get the fuck off my lawn. Guess what? You're still going to act appropriately. You're going to come across as you belong walking to and from. Hey, I totally understand. It sounds like this is not a good time. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that we are delivering valuable information. Most of your neighbors have asked for this, and that's why I wanted you to have it. They could still say, you know what? I don't want your fucking trash. Hey, I completely understand. Hopefully, I'll see you next time. Anyways, my name's Wilson. Uh, what was your name? I'll still ask for it. <laughs> no? Here's the thing. That person is going to eventually come to realize he's never going to get rid of me. The only way he could get rid of me is if he moves. <laughs> and guess who's the most persistent person that's going to be in his life that's a 
real estate agent. <laughs> Me. <laughs> So you have to develop a really strong mindset. I have a bunch of points that we can talk about, but I don't know if you guys want to just take a break and, you know, if you have questions, we can do some Q and A real quick. I have a question. Yes. Um, can we see the? Yeah, I can pass this around. This is one of the things that is what I call evergreen. Yeah. Never expires. If I pass it out five years later, is going to be appropriate. Evergreen means that it's just valuable information that you know is not time sensitive, like market stats. Um, that I'll pass around. Do you send, but you send out stats as well? I do send out market stats. In fact, yesterday I got a call. Um, Kinsey, who's in this room, who works with us, heard that call. Have you guys ever gotten complaints from other agents, whether for whatever reason? Um, I'm sure you guys have. Yes. <laughs> for farm, for farming? farming, yeah. So I'll tell you what happened. Um, we have a we have a postcard and it has other properties on there represented by other firms but I did put brokerage information of the other firm and if you guys know the code of ethics you can do that as long as you visibly display who the listing broker is well I get a call yesterday one of my agents are farming and he says oh you know I don't really appreciate that you're using my photos and that, you know, I work really hard for this listing, which I don't doubt he did. But you didn't ask for permission. I don't want you to flyer. I don't want you to use this. Then I asked him one question, and I said, hey, thank you so much for your call. Did you ask Redfin to remove the photos from their website as well? What about Zillow? What about Compass's website? What about this other person that I know? Mm -hmm. If you're asking me, shouldn't you ask all these other people? And then he said, oh, you're going to play that game. OK, well, I already spoke to an attorney. I'm fairly certain that you're, you're, you're blah, blah, blah. I'll talk to him again. I'm going to report you to the DRE. And I just gladly say, hey, I would love that. Because I already know the rules. In fact, I texted a guy and said, hey, look, this, here's the rules. I displayed your brokerage information. I could do this. So let's back up a bit and think about that situation. I did a little research. He gets listings in that area. My agent is a newer agent. She's starting to farm that area. My job as a team lead is to take a stand for my agents. Because if I was a new agent and that happened to me, guess what we're more likely to do? Oh shit, I'm in trouble. I need to stop. I need to pick a different farm. No. If you know the rules, you play by the rules. Just like the NFL, how do you draft right winning plays? is to obviously outwork the defense and to score the ball, right? But you play by the rules, and I'm within the rules. So I bring that up because when you go out and farm, you're going to be faced with someone that has claimed an area. You guys know who those people are in the marketplace. Those people that claimed an area feel the need to defend their time and their efforts and their money that they've committed over the years. Well, last I checked, no one owes you a relationship. You have to build your relationships, right? No one owes anything to anybody. It's a two-way street. It's mutual. So when I back up and I think about that situation, he is coming from a scarce mindset. He is trying to defend something he has no control of which is the people that live in his farm. He feels insecure because someone else is putting effort in trying to gain market share when he is not. So mindset is really important when you do anything, especially if you're competing for business, and especially if you're starting something for a first time, like anything. You're going to have you know, people that are going to discourage you. And that's commonplace as you become more and more prominent as a productive and successful agent. My best word of advice to you is do everything with integrity so you can sleep at night, but make sure you commit to your activities because you know what success is for you for your own journey. right? You can define that, not someone else. And just because someone tries to scare you off, think principally and think what is right for you and your business. Yeah, I've got a bunch of questions, so I don't want to take them all. But, uh, no, no problem. We got uh, time. Do you pull uh, age demographics um, for 
for your farm to tailor to, tailor to certain events or do not worry about that? Did you say age? Yeah. Um, I don't. I do think that if you want to get really niche and granular for mailings and have different marketing messages, you can. So for example, absentee mailings, which represent 15 to 20% of all our addresses in our local neighborhoods, probably has a different marketing message than owner occupants. Um, and obviously people that don't have mortgages, maybe it's a different message versus the people that do have mortgages. If there's a way you can search by product of mortgage, that might be really good to craft different messages for people to have ARM products right now that are forced to refinance or sell. Um, but I don't. Um, here's why. The more, and I talk about this as one of the points later, the more friction we create to accomplish something, the less likely we're actually going to act on it. So here's what I mean. I mentioned this another time in a different presentation. If you need to go to the gym, you're just going to go to the gym at the time that you allocate it. But if you have to drink pre-workout, go exactly at this time, do your laundry, make sure you grab coffee on the way there, eat a banana as well at the same time, and the bench press has to be open, guess what you're going to do? You're going to think, well, this time is really busy. The bench press is not going to be open. Uh, I don't want to wait. And you know the coffee shop's not quite open yet, or it's going to be really busy at this time. So, But the less kind of friction we create for our activities, the easier it is, the more likely we'll do it. So for me, I just blanket the neighborhood. I just say simply, I got a two-hour time block today. I'm just going to go out and do it. My flyers are imperfect. Do I have enough? Is it really hot or really cold today, or is it cloudy? I just say two hour window, I'm gonna go out and do it. Not to say that's what you're thinking of, but sure. you know, that, that's what I think of as I think about that. Once you pick a farm, you've picked out whatever farm you're gonna do, say you're starting a new one, what does, can you kind of go over with, what does your marketing points and your touches look like? I know. Yep, oh, I have that. Let's, so. let's review that, actually. Okay. Um, this is ideal because I haven't done this as consistently. I'll be transparent with you. If I meet someone and I capture their contact, obviously I know where they live. I want to write a handwritten note. What's on the handwritten note? Card, a letterhead, and it just says, hey, Linda, it was nice meeting you in a neighborhood this week. Let's keep in touch with Gratitude Wilson. Nothing about business besides my card. They'll know. Um, eight by eight campaign, that's eight emails in eight days if I get their email. Uh, four calls to invites. Those are my only calls I make. And here's what it sounds like. Ring, ring. Let's say Linda does not pick up. Ring, ring. Hey, Linda, this is Wilson from Own Real Estate. We met a couple months ago in the neighborhood. I wanted to make sure I invited you to our upcoming event. I know we had talked about events prior when we had met in person. And also, I'm going to, this is the link, blah, blah, blah. This is the key part. Linda, if nothing has changed since the last time we spoke, I'll reach back out in a couple months. <coughs> if something has changed, if you have any questions for me, if you're thinking about changing your roof, if you're thinking about you know, renting out a part of your house, if you're thinking about making improvements in your house, just give a couple of like, highly likely points that she might be thinking about. Give me a call. Once again, this is Wilson, the guy you met in the neighborhood, 415-828-7809. Linda, really appreciate your time. It was great meeting you the other day. Why did I say my name at the end? I want her to keep remembering. Wilson, 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 Wilson. Everything I get is freaking Wilson. I can't get rid of this guy. And guess what he's going to think of? Not just real estate needs, but when I have a need, this guy's everywhere. Maybe he knows. 